Welcome! On this DVD, we shall learn about the basics of chess endgames. What is a chess endgame? Endgames are positions when there are few pieces left on the board. Most of them are already exchanged. In order to win a chess game, you need to know how to checkmate. Or on the other side, how to avoid it. That's what we're going to learn. Usually, when one side has a rook versus just a single pawn, it's a simple win. A rook is worth five points after all, while a pawn only one. However, if that pawn is quite advanced, especially with the help of the king, it can be dangerous to save the game. Its goal is to promote with the help of the king, and when the rook captures the pawn, the king would capture the rook. So therefore, white needs to be careful and needs to bring the king to help, because together the rook and the king can stop the pawn and the king. And once the pawn is stopped, the king and the rook can attack the pawn and capture it. That's what we'll see in this example. White brings the king, black advances the pawn, white brings the king, king comes to help, king c4, Pawn advances, king c3, king e2. Now black is threatening to promote the pawn. However, it's white's turn, and white will play king c2, attacking the promotion square a second time. And now, if black still promotes the pawn, the white rook will simply capture the queen. Also, if black does not promote the pawn, for example, the king moves to e3, hanging on to that pawn on d2. White would play rook d1, attacking the pawn a second time and capturing it next move. Here the obvious move, catching the pawn by playing king f6, would be a big mistake. Because white would advance the pawn, give it up. However, when black captures the pawn, it's stalemate. The game is a draw. This is another proof how accuracy is very important in the endgame. There is no second chance. The correct move here is to give a check with the rook. Now, after king h7, to play king f6, g7, king f7, and now again the promotion square is attacked enough times, and let's say after king h6, Black could just play rook g8 and win the pawn. This is another very important position to remember. Not just the position, but the idea itself. When one side has two connected pass pawns, meaning two pawns next to each other, versus a rook, and the kings are far away, not playing much role in the position, two pawns are stronger on the sixth rank, just two ranks away from promotion than a rook. Even though it's black's turn in this position, black cannot save the game. You can try to figure it out on a chessboard, but no matter what, the two pawns will win. One of them will promote, and black can only capture it so that the other pawn will recapture and a new queen will be born. For example, black can delay the end by giving a few checks but not save the game. That would only help white by chasing the king, helping the pawns. But even without black giving all these checks, for example, black would try to attack one of the pawns. White could simply push the other pawn, and then either the rook would capture the pawn when the f-pawn promotes, and queen versus rook is a win, as we shall see later, or if after f7, now black is running after the other pawn, trying to catch it, white would push the e-pawn now, and again, one of the two pawns will promote. Rook versus bishop is usually a draw. A random position that you see right now on the board is a relatively simple draw. All you have to watch out for, not to lose your bishop. 
there is no way to force the black king to the corner where it could possibly get in danger. In this position, even though the black king is cornered, white can still not win. For example, after the check on h8 with the rook, the black bishop can block the check and white cannot make progress because, for example, after a waiting move, it's stalemate. Or after another rook move, the bishop just moves away again. And when check comes, the bishop comes back to block the check. So it's still a draw. On the other hand, if black has the light-colored bishop in this position, now white is winning. Because white would play king b6, and either if the bishop moves, white simply checks, and now bishop blocks, rook can just capture the bishop checkmate. Or if the king moves next to the bishop, now after pinning the bishop, the bishop cannot move, and black only has one move, it's not stalemate, the king does have a move, king moves to the corner, and now rook takes bishop checkmate. This is quite an amazing position, where white has a rook versus bishop, which normally should be a draw, but white can make a centralizing, quiet move, and amazingly, black gets into Tsukzwang. White plays rook d4. What does Tsukzwang mean? It means that the black bishop, even though it has a lot of squares to go to, has no safe one. And can you believe that this is the winning move, a quiet move like this? Quite amazing. Look at the position. Obviously, the bishop cannot move to any of these squares because it will be just hit on any of those squares. However, it cannot even move to any of the other squares because if bishop c8, there will be a fork by rook d8. If the bishop moves to g2, there is a check with rook g4. Or if the bishop moves to f1, and this is the beautiful part. White plays king g6, threatening checkmate all of a sudden on d8. And the only way trying to escape that is by running out with the king, but that would be stepping into another fork of rook f4 check. Neither helps black trying to run with the king. If the king runs to f8, white checkmates with rook d8. Or, if the king runs to the h-file, the rook forks on h4. The surprising part about this rook move is that it has no threat. The threat is, black's problem is, that black has to make a move and has to worsen his position. If black could just pick up the bishop and put it back to the same square, black would not lose. Black's problem is that either the king or the bishop has to move to a worse place than when they are right now. That's called Tsukzwang, a beautiful example. Rook versus knight usually is also a draw. Black can only get in danger if the king is forced to the edge of the board, or the king and the knight are separated on the totally other side of the board and the knight could be trapped. Those are the two things black needs to watch out for. In the position we see on the board, even though black's king is on the edge of the board, black is still safe. Here black should play either knight d8 check or knight g5 check. Either one is a draw. However, I would recommend to keep the knight close by the king. Now, after king d6, just give another check. Repeating moves, of course, helps black. That's repetition of moves, draw. So white needs to try to look for some other idea. Let's say king back to d5, and now black can just go back and forth, and black is safe. Of course, if black gets the opportunity, black should try to get out from the edge of the board. But for now, the rook is cutting the seventh rank, so the king cannot. However, if the rook would, let's say, move away, we are more than happy to get towards the center with the king. In this example, black is kind of cornered, and that's the problem. Interestingly, the winning move is a waiting move, such as rook g2 or g3 
or even g4. Just like the other example we saw, rook versus bishop, again, black is in Zugzwang. That's what happens. If the king moves this way, obviously the knight just falls. If the king moves to the corner, king moves to f7. And now white is threatening to checkmate, and the knight can only move to an attacked square. How about the knight checking? Doesn't that help? Well, not quite. After knight check, white plays king f6, discover check, king needs to move out, and then king f7. And now the black knight either goes away, and then white just checkmates from this side, or the knight moves to h7 when the rook comes down and checkmates from g8. We're back to rook against pawn. Oh no, just kidding. It's just a typical example that happens quite often actually. That in this position, if black promotes the pawn to a queen, they get checkmated right away by let's say rook c1. That's why in this position, commonly, black would promote the pawn to a knight. That almost gives drawing chances. However, because the knight is cornered, after king f3, the knight will be lost right away and still does not save the game because either after knight g3, king just takes, knight f2, rook just takes and the only other move would be king to f1 that would allow rook c1 checkmate. This is one of the most important positions from the defensive perspective. Black is ahead, black has an extra pawn. And here is how white should save the game. Bringing the rook back to h3, cutting black's king off from the third rank. Now, if black wants to make progress, black would want to push the pawn ahead. Now, black's threat is to come with the king and then try to checkmate. That's why after the pawn advances to d3, white now should move right back to the 8th rank to be ready after king c3 to start checking from behind. Check and check and now white can choose to keep checking or just attack the pawn from the side or behind. That's how white saves the game. Similarly to the last position, now with opposite colors, black would here play rook to the 6th rank waiting until White pushes the pawn to f6 and then right away run back. And now after king g6, start checking from behind and making a draw. This is one of the most important rook endgames to know from the attacking point of view if you want to win. Well, what's the goal here? To promote the pawn, right? It's already on the 7th rank, just one rank away from promotion. The problem, however, is that the white king is right in front of the pawn. So therefore, the pawn cannot promote for now. What would happen if white just gets the king out of there, clears the way for the pawn? Well, black would start giving checks from the side and keep checking and keep checking a lot of checks. And if the king would go towards the rook, so the checks stop, then the rook would get behind the pawn and the pawn would get lost. That's why white needs to do something trickier than that. White should start first by chasing black's king away, by checking with the rook. Now, if the king goes to f6, that would allow king f8 clearing the pass for the pawn because white doesn't have to worry about this check because the pawn would block the check by promoting itself. Therefore, the king would go to h7 and now white has various ways to win. The simplest one here actually is to step behind the pawn and then for example, after a check, just get out and promote the pawn. Or, even after king g7, king d7, and now, because 
the rook is behind the pawn, neither does king f7 stop the pawn promotion because the rook is protecting the pawn, nor does the checks help because the rook is unable to come behind the pawn because white's rook is on e1. However, I also want to show you another method that's called building a bridge. And here is how that works. White could also play rook g4, and let's say black is waiting. Now, white king gets out, clearing the path of the pawn. Black starts checking from behind. King e6, black starts checking. King f6, rook f1 check. King e5. And after rook e1, now here is the bridge. The rook is blocking the check, and then the pawn promotes. If in this position it's black's turn, the game is a draw, because black can give checks from the side, and white has no escape from them, unless the king separates itself from the pawn, and then, as we said earlier, the rook would get behind the pawn, and it's a draw. Having a rook pawn in most endgames is a special situation because it's so close, it is actually at the edge of the board. It has special circumstances. Sometimes it involves stalemate, sometimes other problems like here, for example, the white king cannot easily get out of the corner. It's right in front of its pawn that's only one move away from promotion, and yet the king is unable to rescue itself and clear the path of the pawn. This position is a draw. There isn't much difference between this position and the previous one. We just pushed white's rook and black's king one file over. And it does not make a difference in the result. It's still a draw. White's king still cannot get out of the corner. Now that we pushed the white rook and the black king one file over, the result already changes. The white king will be able to rescue from the corner. This is how. Rook f1, king is trying to get closer, rook f8. Now black has two choices, and there are different ways to win against either one. After king e7, rook g8. Now, finally, the black rook needs to leave the g file. And the white king is ready to escape from the captivity. Check, king h6. Check, king g6. Black needs to keep checking, otherwise the pawn promotes. Check, and now the king escaped to f5. Another check, and one more check, and the checks run out. Now, let's see what happened if instead of king e7, black instead plays king e6. Well, it's a slightly different story. Still rook g8. However, after rook h1, king g7, rook g1, the king cannot escape this way, because after king g5, the pawn would be lost. And after king g6, check, the king cannot escape on f5 like in the previous variation. And after king h5, again, check. So, therefore, after the rook g1 check in this position, the king would escape in the other direction, on f8, which it could not do in the position when the king was on e7. So the king escapes on f8, rook f1 check, and king e8. It seems to be over, but not quite. Black can still cause some problems by playing rook a1, setting up a trap. Now, if white carelessly promotes the pawn, black checkmates all of a sudden. Certainly something to avoid. That's why in this position, white would play rook g6 check. And after king f5, the tricky move is rook f6 check, sacrificing the rook, because if king captures, queen promotes with a check, and when the king moves away, the queen can capture the rook. After rook f6 check, of course, black is not forced to capture the rook. For example, the king can get out of the check to g5, 
And now white needs to be careful again. It's still not good to promote the pawn to a queen because a skewer comes, a check. King moves out and white loses the new queen. That is why after king g5, white here would play rook f8. Threatening now to promote the pawn. And after the check on a8, white still has to be careful. Only correct move is to move to f7. Otherwise, after king e7, rook a7 would capture the pawn the following move on h7. So king has to move to f7. And after rook a7, king g8 protecting the pawn. And now black cannot stop the pawn promoting next move on h8. In this position, white's problem is different. Not the king is cornered, but the rook. What happens is, if the rook moves, the pawn is lost. However, if it's white's turn in this position, white can win, thanks to a tactical opportunity, by playing rook h8. Now, white is threatening to promote the pawn, because the rook is protecting the new queen. And if black captures the pawn, that allows Rook h7 check, winning black's rook on the following move. On the other hand, going back to the same starting position, if it is black's move, black can save the game by playing king g7. Remember this position. This is a key position to save a game even though black is down a pawn. In these positions, when a pawn is far advanced all the way to the 7th rank, with a rook right in front of it, and you have your rook behind the pawn. The king needs to be either on g7 or h7. And the game is a draw. Why? Because the white rook is not able to clear the pass of the pawn without losing the pawn. The only way white could accomplish that is if the white king could go to b6 and then after protecting the pawn on a7, now the rook could get out and then promote. However, the problem is that black will patiently wait by making waiting moves with the rook or with the king until the white king gets all the way to b6 or b7 protecting this pawn. And the minute that happens, that's when black will start giving checks from far away. That's why it's important to keep the distance between the rook and the king. Imagine if this rook would give the check here on b5. The checks run out very quickly. The king could go to a6 or c6 and then attack the rook and protect the pawn. That's why always keep the rook in distance. Keep giving the checks from as much distance as you can. And then when the king moves away from the pawn, then you can either give another check or just move back behind the pawn. The rule of thumb is as soon as the king protects that pawn, trying to help the rook to get out, that's when you start giving checks. As soon as the king is away from the pawn, you're safe to go back behind the pawn. If the king is trying instead come down and chase the rook away, then again you keep distance from the king. And when the king goes back up, the rook comes back down. So being ready when the king gets to b6 to give the check from b1 or b2. Try not to get close to the king. Another trick to know about these positions is that the king is not safe on the 6th rank or 5th rank for the reason that the rook can get out of the corner with a check and then just promote the pawn. That is why, remember, the king needs to be on g7 or h7 in order to make a draw. In this position, white's pawn only reached the 6th rank, not the 7th. And that is a major difference, because if now black tries to do the same thing, playing rook a1, black would lose, because after the king is getting closer to the pawn, the king will have a hiding place on a7, and then the white rook can escape from the corner. However, in this position, black has a different saving method, namely, Playing rook f6, attacking the pawn from the side. Now, after 
a7. Black would not attack the pawn from the side anymore because that would allow white getting the rook out by sacrificing the rook and then promoting the pawn. However, now we are back to the previous example. The rook is behind the pawn and after king d4, the rook rushes back to be ready to giving the checks after king c5, b6 with rook b1. Now, after rook f6, if white doesn't rush, pushing the pawn to a7, but brings the king again close to the pawn to protect the pawn on a6, black can simply give the checks from the side this time. Keep giving the checks, and when the king is away from the pawn, go back to f6, getting ready if a7 behind the pawn. Another important note that in these positions after rook a7, the safest place to go is up to g6. And again, the rook still cannot escape because it needs to protect the pawn on a6. Here white has two extra pawns. Usually, especially if they are connected, that's a simple win. Let's see how. White advances the king, king d6. Black is trying to hold the rook on the sixth rank, so white couldn't just push the king down further with a check with rook b6. But now the rook comes from the other side, rook h1, forcing the rook to leave, otherwise rook h6 is a skewer. Let's say rook a8, rook h6, check. Pushing the king down, king e5, now black has only one check, after rook a5, we block the check, rook back down to a1, and rook h7, king d8, and now king e6. It's very important in these positions to use the pawns as a shield of the king. As you see, again, after this check, we block the check by pushing the pawn ahead. Now, white threatens to checkmate in one move with rook h8, king c8, rook h8. King had to go out from under the pawn. And now, king e7, getting out of the pin. The pawn could not move right away. Rook a4, and moving the pawn out of danger, and then one or both pawns will promote easily. This endgame has a lot of pawns, so it's quite different. In these situations, especially when there is equal amount of pawns, it's crucial whose pieces are more active. In this position, it's white's. As you can see, white's king is centralized, while black's king is still far away from the middle of the board. Also, white's rook is on the seventh rank, attacking black's pawns, while black is on the defensive. That's why white is in a winning position here. Let's see how. White simply moves to the queen side, trying to attack black's pawn and rook. And now the king is getting to b7, chasing away the rook which was protecting the pawn on a7. And white captures the pawn. And now black can try to get counterplay by attacking white's pawns. By rook d2, white's king getting out of the pawn's way. Rook captures pawn. a7, pawn is almost promoting. Rook check. White rook can block. Now the best black can do, give the rook up for the newly born queen. Rook takes and king takes. Now black can try to create a passed pawn, but it's a little slow in this case. H5, the king now needs to run back. King E6, needing to hold on to the pawn on F7. King B6, F5. King c5, king e5, 
rook e7 check, king f6, and king d6. The main idea here for white is to bring the king closer back to where the white pawns are, making sure black cannot create a pass pawn, or if they do, it will be caught in time before it becomes a queen. King g5, king e5, king g4, and now white can even attack more of black's pawns by rook g7, g5, and now play h4 or king f6, winning the game. This is another rook endgame where the difference between the activity of the rooks is decisive. White's rook is behind the pawn, while black's pawn is under the pawn. Black's rook cannot move, because if it moves, white's pawn is ready to promote. Therefore, he's just sitting there waiting, while white's rook can make moves. However, here the other factor decides the game. Namely, that the white king is also closer to the queen side. And white can play king e4. Black can try to stop white's king, but not quite. King d5, king e7, king c6. Now, white is threatening to attack the rook by simply playing king c7, which black can still stop by playing king d8. But now, white has various ways to win. One is to simply chase the black king away and then play king c7. Or the other being rook a1, that's another method to win in such and similar positions, and then going down to a8 trading rooks. Another difficult type of endgame is rook and bishop versus a rook. Normally speaking, it's a draw, but it's a pretty hard one. If you're on the rook side, I don't envy you. I have been, and it wasn't fun. White can try a lot of tricks, and you have to be very careful not to fall into it. This position on the board right now is still a draw, if black plays accurately. Black here should play rook f6 trying to keep white's king away from the 6th rank. Black's plan should be, after that, trying to rescue the king from the edge of the board. For example, after king d4, rook d6, king e5, and then rook d7. Of course, trading rooks would equal draw. Therefore, now, white must avoid that. For example, rook a8 check, and then king c7. Try to be on the other side than where the white king is, not opposite, but on a diagonal opposite from the white king in this case. And now, after another check, the king could just go back to d8 with an objectively drawn position. However, I warn you, it could be still a lot of sweating if white tries real hard, but objectively it's a draw. This is just a sample example of the dangers that black needs to face in this position. Here, with white to move, white is winning the following way. Rook moves to b4. Now, white is threatening to check with the bishop, forcing the king to d8, and then checkmating two moves after rook b8. Unfortunately for black, there's not much they can do about it. They can try to escape right away with the idea that after rook b8 check, they would block with rook c8. However, white has a very tricky winning move here, cutting the rook off with bishop c4 and renewing that threat of rook b8 checkmate. The only way not to give up the rook and get away from the checkmate is playing king c8, but then again, bishop e6 and king d8, rook b8 wins for white. A couple of tips about rook endgames. In general, it is better to keep the rook behind the pawn rather than in front or on the side, whether it comes to your own pawn that you're trying to support to become a queen or your opponent's pawn that you're trying to stop from becoming one. Also, another important tip 
Usually, try to keep your rook far away from the king you're trying to check. The further they are from each other, the more checks you have, and the better it will be. We have just learned about the most popular endgames, pawn endgames and rook endgames. Now we learn about the bishop endgames. In the position you see on the board, white has a bishop and an extra pawn. However, it is a rook pawn. If it was any other pawn, let's say a knight pawn, a bishop pawn or a center pawn, white would be winning very easily. However, in this position, white does have a rook pawn. And the promotion square of that pawn is of an opposite color than where the white bishop is running. And therefore, this is a unique situation where white cannot win. There is no way to chase out the black king from the corner. Even after white advances the pawn, for example, bringing the king to help, black just stays in the corner sitting and waiting. White advances the pawn and let's say brings the king to help. Black is just waiting, moving back and forth in the corner. The pawn can advance but never promote. Because the closer white would get with the king and the bishop, the position will be stalemate right away. And there is no way to checkmate the king or chase it out from the corner so the pawn could promote. Therefore, this is a theoretical drawn position. This is worth remembering. You can get some lucky escapes this way. That even though you're down a bishop and a pawn, you can save the game this way. Wow! What a position we are seeing here. White has a bishop and now not just one extra pawn, but five. However, they are all on the same file, on the rook file, the h file in this case. And believe it or not, it does not change the result. Just like when white had only one pawn, here having five still doesn't help. The game is still a draw. Black would do exactly the same like before, move back and forth between h7 and h8, sometimes g8 and h8 if needed. And white cannot make progress. All white can do is move back and forth or create a stalemate. Can you notice the change in the position? Very small, but very important at the same time. Well, I just moved the white bishop from a light square to a dark square. Well, that changes the whole picture. Because no longer can the black king stay in the corner. It won't even get there, or if it would, it could be chased out. So white would win here very simply, bringing the king closer, and black waiting around the corner doesn't help, because white could play king g6, and then simply push the pawn up, and the king cannot go to the corner, must go away, and therefore the pawn would simply promote. And white is winning. Remember, the important point here is that the bishop is running on dark squares, which is the same color as the promotion square of the pawn, of the h pawn. So white is winning here. If it's opposite color, it's a draw. If it's the same color as the corner promotion square, it is a win. Now we shall see a couple of positions with bishop endgames where both sides have bishops, moreover, on the same colors. The first position we see is a very simple position. White has an extra pawn. However, the black king is right in front of the pawn. And as you can see, white's bishop is running on opposite colors than where the king is standing up. Therefore, there is no way at all to chase the king out of that square. And what does that mean? That white pawn cannot advance, cannot become a queen. And because of that, white cannot make any progress whatsoever. Black will simply make 
any random movie, The Bishop, just making sure you don't put it under attack and will be captured. Other than that, you don't need to worry about anything. Just keep the king where it is, keep moving the bishop, and white cannot make progress. In the position you see on the board right now, black's king is again blocking white's pawn. However, it is on the same color as white's bishop is running on. Therefore, the white bishop could chase the king out of there soon. However, white needs to be careful how they do it. Well, the first step is to protect the pawn, because black is about to capture it with his king. So white's king should move up and protect it. But there are two good ways and a bad one. The bad one is moving to e6. And the reason is that now black's king has no move whatsoever. And black can escape with a cute stalemate combination. Black can play bishop to b3, pinning white's bishop. The bishop cannot run away. And if it captures the sacrificed bishop, it's stalemate. Let's put the position back to this position. And the correct move is to protect the pawn from either side. It's slightly more accurate to do it from f6, although the other side works as well. Now, white is threatening to checkmate with bishop to b5. After black would play bishop a4, stopping that, the bishop would come from the other side playing bishop to f7, chasing the king out from the promotion square, and the pawn is ready to promote. We are still looking at bishop endgames with an extra pawn for white. However, in this case, black's king is not in front of the pawn. Black's bishop is the one trying to catch it. Now, remember, if white simply promotes the pawn to a queen right now, right here, by advancing the pawn, black would simply capture the queen with the bishop and resulting a king-bishop versus king endgame. As we learned earlier, that's a complete draw. There is no possible way to win, no matter how badly black would play after that. The game would be an automatic draw. However, white can try other methods to win the game. Let's see how black should defend to hold the game to a draw. White could play bishop to d1, which is a tricky move, trying to lure the bishop away from the diagonal where the bishop is controlling the promotion square. For example, if the bishop would capture the bishop, white's pawn would freely promote to a queen, and that would be a relatively easy win. Of course, black is not forced at all to capture white's bishop. Black has enough squares on the diagonal where it's on and can move to b5 or c6 or d7. Any of those moves work. Now, white can try to do the same trick again from e2. Of course, again, black would not capture white's bishop, but just move away, let's say, back to a4. Now, white can decide to do a different trick. Move the bishop to h5, and after bishop b5, try to offer a trade of bishops. Of course, again, black should say no, thank you, because after trading bishops, white's king would recapture, still protecting the pawn, and then move out of the pawn's way, and just promote the pawn. After bishop e8, black needs to try to get to the promotion square from the other side. And here is how black does it. Moves the bishop back to d1, or it could be c2 as well. And after the bishop moving, let's say, to b5, not allowing the bishop to go back to this diagonal, the bishop now would come from the other side, h5, again with the same idea getting ready when white promotes the pawn to a queen to capture it and make a draw. Now white can try the other trick from this side, 
with bishop to e2, again sacrificing the bishop, giving it up in order to promote the pawn, but black again would say no thank you, and move the bishop away to g6 or f7, and white cannot make progress, only go around and around, but without achieving the win. We made a small difference from the previous position by moving white's e-pawn to the g5. It doesn't seem like a big difference, but it is. And the reason for it is because now the diagonal of the black bishop from this side, g887, is too short. And I'll show you how white can take advantage of that. White would play bishop to h7, the same method we tried in the previous position, but was not good enough to win. Black would wait, hoping that white would promote the pawn, but white will not. White will again offer a trade of bishops, and after bishop d3, move the bishop out of the way of the pawn. The bishop moves to h7, trying to again control the promotion square, and now, after bishop c2, this diagonal of g8 and h7 is too short for black. Black does not have i6 here, right? There is no such a square on the chessboard of i6. It ends with h, and therefore the bishop cannot hang on to the promotion square any longer. The best black can do is capture the bishop, but that would allow the white pawn to promote and reach a easily winning endgame. Well, we just learned about same colored bishop endgames. Now we're switching on to opposite colored bishop endgames. They are quite different in many ways from same colored bishops endgames. Well, the position we see on the board, black has a far advanced pawn, only one square away from promotion. However, white's bishop is controlling that square. In case black promotes the pawn to a queen, the white bishop is ready to capture it and reach a drawn position. Unlike with the same colored bishop endgames, here black has no hope of chasing away white's bishop, because if the king would try to do so, the bishop has all these squares on the diagonal, and except the king, no other piece can even attempt chasing that bishop away. That's why this starting position is quite a simple draw. White can just hang on to the diagonal where the bishop is on, keep making moves, just waiting for the time when black promotes the pawn and then capture it and it's a draw. Opposite colored bishop endgames are famous for being a draw, even often when one side is down, one, two, or even more, three, four pawns. In this case, in the position we see on the board, black is ahead by two pawns and yet cannot win. The reason is, if black would advance the d pawn to d3, forking white's king and bishop, white could just give up the bishop for the two pawns, reaching again a theoretical drawn position where black even has no hope to try to win. Also, advancing the other pawn to c3 wouldn't make progress because black, after bishop d3, cannot advance either pawn without losing them. Black's only hope here would be if the black king could fly or get around to e3 and then play d3 without losing both pawns when the bishop captures the pawn. However, in this case, the black king is too busy protecting the pawn on the light square on c4. Understanding that, you should remember to keep your bishop between e2 and f1, making sure to put pressure on the pawn on c4 so the king does not have the time to get around to e3 and help the advancement of the d-pawn. Also, if white would move away the bishop on this diagonal, the pawn could advance easily to d3. So for those two reasons, you want to make sure you keep your bishop either on f1 
or E2 back and forth. And if the black king would move around here, you would, of course, just capture the pawn on C4. Therefore, this is a drawn position. Black cannot make progress. In this example, white has two extra pawns. However, they are not connected pawns. Therefore, it's harder for the king to catch them at the same time. This is white can try here, to get the king around to f7 and then try to advance the pawn. Before the white king can do that, the bishop needs to protect the pawn on c6. By moving the bishop to f3, black is just waiting, hanging on, making sure the pawn on e6 cannot advance. Now the king is going around, black keeps waiting, bishop h4, king f5, and now we're using the king to come to help black the advancement of the e-pawn. Now, if the white king continues going around, black could safely capture the pawn on e6, because after c7, the king is catching the pawn right on time. Now, white can make a tricky move by playing bishop to d5. This way, the bishop protects both pawns and the black king cannot capture the bishop because then the c-pawn will promote. Yet, black has nothing to worry. The bishop comes to the rescue. Bishop comes to d8, stopping the c-pawn from advancing right on time so after king g6, the black king can come to e7 and block the e-pawn from advancing while the bishop is catching the other pawn on c7. Therefore, white again cannot make progress. This is very typical for opposite colored bishop endgames, that the defensive side, even being two pawns down, sometimes even more pawns, can save the game. In this position, you see a lot more pawns on both sides, yet black is ahead two pawns. However, they cannot make any progress whatsoever, because all of white's pieces are on dark squares, and the only black piece that could possibly attack any of white's pieces is the king. But that's not enough. You may try, but you'll find out there's nothing black can do here. All white can do or has to do rather, move the bishop back and forth on any safe square where it will not be captured. There are plenty of choices. Or if it would run out, you can do the same with the king. That's a dead draw. Knights are very different from bishops. They jump from dark square to white square, and then to a dark square again, unlike bishops who need to stay in the same color constantly. Also, another big difference between the bishop and the knight is that the knight is a relatively slow piece. It needs time to jump from one side of the board to another, unlike bishops, which can go in one move from one side, one end of the board to another. However, the knights are tricky pieces because they can jump over other pieces. Let's learn now about some knight endgames. In this position, black seems to be in serious trouble. The knight is under attack, and if the knight moves away to a safe-looking square, white's pawn is ready to promote and become a queen, which results a simple win for white. However, in this position, black can still save the game by moving right to the corner with the knight, stopping the promotion of the pawn. And if white king captures the knight, as we learned earlier about pawn endgames, black's king would move to f7, or f8 for that matter, locking in the white king in the corner. It cannot escape, and it's stalemate. In this position, black seems to be again in big trouble. White's pawn is just one square away from promotion, and there's no way the black king or knight 
could attack that promotion square in just one move. Yet, black can save the game. By moving the knight to e5, getting ready that when the pawn promotes to a queen, black gives a fork, check with the knight, and next move captures the new queen, ending the game in a draw. If after knight e5, white does not promote the pawn to a queen, but let's say moves the king out of the way to g7, the knight already conveniently moves to f7, reaching the promotion square. If the pawn promotes, knight just takes the new queen, or if the king moves to g8, black can either just move back and forth with the king, hanging on to the knight, or as we just learned before, black could even play knight h8, both resulting in a draw. In this position, there is one major difference compared to the previous two, and that is that the black king is far away from the king's side, where the action is. Here, black would need to catch the pawn as early as possible, namely by playing knight g5. Now, black is ready. If the pawn advances, knight captures pawn, and the game is a draw. However, white can be trickier than that. White can try king g6 to chase the knight away. Now, if the knight is not careful where it's jumping, moves, let's say, to e4 or f3, white's pawn is ready to advance, and black cannot catch anymore the pawn. The pawn will promote, and white will win. The correct move here is knight to e6, and that's the only saving move. Now, if white advances the pawn anyway, black is ready to check, and on the following move, after the king moves out of the check, again knight captures pawn. Draw. After knight e6, white can try to chase the knight further by playing king f6. Now the knight needs to go to f8 to stop the pawn from advancing to h7. After king f7, the knight would go to h7. After king g7, the knight would go to g5. After king g6, again back to e6, and the circle goes around and around without white being able to make any progress. It's a drone endgame. This is definitely one worth remembering. This comes up quite frequently in tournament play. This is a very important idea, concept, that you should remember. The worst location for a knight is the g7 or b7 or g2 or b2 squares. Here, white attacking the knight by playing h6. In this position, white, after advancing the pawn, attacks the knight. And even though the knight has two moves to reach the h8 promotion square, the knight cannot get there. The pawn will promote. Now we're going to learn about knight and pawn versus knight endgames. Of course, the goal here also is for white to promote the pawn, because the knight in itself cannot win. In the position you see on the board, black's king and knight are both guarding that promotion square. However, white can chase the knight away, and then the pawn will be able to promote. White plays knight e6, sacrificing the knight. This is called also deflection or removing the guard. Now, black has two choices. Move away, let's say capture the knight, but that allows the pawn promotion. Not a good choice. Or, moving the knight right in front of the pawn on the promotion square. The problem now is that white is able to give a check from f8 or even from c5, chasing black's king away from protecting the knight, and then white's king will capture the knight and win easily the game. 
In this position, the white pawn is not advanced as far as in the previous one. It still needs two squares before it would promote. If in this position, white pushes the pawn, black has a tricky way to save the game. Attacking the pawn by playing knight e5. Remember, I'm saying attacking the pawn because giving the knight up for the pawn would result in an automatic draw. That's why, even though we're giving up a stronger piece for just the pawn, it's like attacking the pawn because it would end the game right away. After the pawn now promotes, black is ready to give a check, a fork, and then capture white's new queen. That is why white should do everything they can to avoid giving up that last pawn. Because if that pawn is gone, the game is over. Draw. White can try to play king e6, not allowing the black knight to move to e5 and then capture the pawn. Now, the black king needs to come to help. King g6. The pawn can advance now, but black is still saving the game after checking the king. Now, the white king needs to stay close to the pawn, otherwise the black king would capture it. King e7, knight f5, check again. Now, if the king moves to f8, that would block the road of the pawn, so all black would need to do is attack the pawn a second time and then capture it. Next move. Or, if the king moves to e6, then we're just repeating moves, check again. And the only other way to hang on to the pawn on f7 is playing king e8, and then the check comes from g7. And now, after king f8, the knight would move again back to f5, followed by attacking the pawn with knight h6, or repeating moves after king e8 and knight g7. White again cannot make progress. Now we shall learn about endgames bishop versus knight. Generally speaking, bishops are stronger in positions when there are pawns on both sides of the board. The reason is because bishops can get very quickly from one side of the board to another. On the other hand, when all the pawns are on the same side of the board, knights usually are stronger because they can alternate from dark to light and dark squared, while the bishops are stuck on the color they are on. In our first position, white has a winning advantage. White has an extra pawn that's only one square away from promotion. Yet, the black knight for now is controlling that promotion square, so if white would promote the pawn right away, the knight could just capture the pawn and it would be a draw. As we know, king and bishop versus king does not win, unless there are pawns on the board as well. In this position, white is winning with an interesting method that we discussed earlier on this tape, and that is called Zugzwang. If black could just keep this position and, let's say, lift up the king and put it back where it is, or lift up the knight and put it back where it is, white could not make progress. However, there is no such rule in chess. You must make a move every time it's your turn. That is why, after here, white moving the bishop away to h3, now either the black king or knight has to move. If the knight moves, white's pawn will promote, and more importantly, be the check. So therefore, black does not have the time to give a fork with the knight. If instead black's king moves, then the problem is that nobody protects the knight. So white is winning in either case. In this position, white has an extra pawn again. Now, it's very important whose move it is. If it's black's turn, black would just move the knight away from the edge of the board 
and the game would be a very simple draw because the white bishop cannot chase out the black king from in front of the pawn and all black would need to do is move randomly with the knight making sure not to lose the knight. However, if it is white's turn in this position, white can cut out the knight by playing bishop to d5. This is another idea I recommend to remember. Remember, the knight on the edge of the board can get in big trouble. Look, the bishop is controlling all the squares where the knight could possibly go to. Anywhere the knight moves, the bishop would capture it. Therefore, not to lose the knight, black only can move the king. But the problem then is, then white's pawn will be able to move ahead. For example, if the king moves to the corner, white king would move to h6. Now, the only move is to move the knight, for example, to c4. And that's a tricky move, because if white captures the knight, that would be, you know what, stalemate, yes. However, white is not forced to capture the knight, but can push the pawn and say, checkmate. It wouldn't help black either if the king goes the other way. Even though white will not checkmate as quickly, but the pawn will be promoted, and that would be just as good as winning. King f6, and now either the king moves or the knight moves, white is just ready to advance the pawn and then promote it on the following move. Just like in most endgames where there are pawns on the board, it's all about if the pawn will promote. In this position, if white would advance the pawn right away, the game would result in a draw right away after bishop captures that last pawn. If white advances the pawn immediately, black would capture the pawn and the game would end in a draw right away. That's why white has to try everything they can not to give up that last pawn. White can try to play knight d5 with the idea of cutting black's bishop out, next move, knight f6. Can you guess what black's move should be here? The only correct move here is bishop to d8. Now again, if the pawn advances, bishop just takes the pawn. If now white continues attacking the bishop, the bishop just moves back, as now knight f6 does not do anything because the king doesn't protect anymore that square, the bishop would just capture the knight for free. Here, White's goal is, as usual, try to chase away that bishop from the promotion square. And this is how to do it. King b5, king f4, moving the king around to attack the bishop. And the bishop has no safe square to go to. That would still control the promotion square. Once the bishop leaves that diagonal, the pawn can freely promote. And White is winning. Now we'll learn about queen endgames. First of all, queen versus pawn. Well, that's a big difference, a whole queen against a tiny pawn. Oh yes, normally that's a very, very easy win. However, if that pawn is far advanced, like in the position you see right now on the board, there may be some difficulties. Let's learn about them. Well, what is the problem in this position? If black manages to promote the pawn, they'll equalize. There will be a queen for both sides, and that should be a simple draw. Normally, queen versus queen is a simple draw unless there is some special circumstance. So, white must do everything in their power to stop that pawn from promoting. However, the difficulty is that white's king is far away. We need to get it closer in order to capture that pawn. Let's see the technique how to do it. 
First, we need to get the queen closer to the action to black's king and pawn by a check. Now, if the king moves in front of the pawn, that would stop the threat of promoting the pawn. And we are ready to bring our king closer. Our goal is to get the king all the way here, close to the pawn, so then we can attack it with the queen and capture it. But I doubt that our opponents will do us that favor. They'll try to stay away from the promotion square to keep it clear for the pawn. Let's say king f2. Now we have to stop the pawn from promoting by moving right behind the pawn. We are attacking the pawn, so we are forcing black to come to e1, protecting the pawn. Now we still cannot bring our king because the King is helping the pawn. If king g7, black safely could promote the pawn. And now comes the very important move. A check with the queen. Now, if the king moves away, white can simply capture the pawn and win. So the only other choice for black here is to move the king to d1. And now we achieved our goal. Ready to move the king because the pawn cannot promote. The black king is right in front of it. So now black should try to move out again and threaten to promote the pawn. Note that if the king would move to c1, the pawn would be pinned and therefore we could just move our king closer again. The pawn could not promote right now because that would leave the black king in check. After king c2, this is how we continue. We pin the pawn. Now the pawn cannot advance. King c1, again, trying to help the pawn to promote. By the way, if the king moves to c3, the first thing we want to do is take that promotion square. So we no longer need to worry about that pawn promoting and then simply bring the king closer. So, after king to c1, we will do the same trick that we just did a minute ago. Check on c4, king moves to b2, we move behind the pawn, attacking the pawn, forcing the black king to come to protect the pawn, and again we check, now from the other side. Same idea, if king moves away, we capture the pawn, so the king needs to go under the pawn, blocking the pass of the pawn, and that means bringing the king time, king f6. Now, king e2, we do the same thing over again. Pinning the pawn, king moves down, we check, king moves away, we attack the pawn, king moves protecting the pawn, and check again. Now, king has to move under the pawn, and that means we can bring the king again closer. Again, King c2, one more time, queen e2 pinning the pawn, king down, black is threatening to promote the pawn, check, king away from the pawn, now queen goes behind the pawn, attacking it, king protects the pawn, and again the queen check, forcing the king under the pawn, that means finally we are getting the king real close, king d4, king e2, and now we don't even need to do the pinning and behind the pawn stuff, we can straight away give the check, because our king is close enough, helping out the queen. Now, the black king must move under the pawn again, and now, finally, the king is right where it needs to be, helping the queen, attacking the pawn a second time, and after king c1, finally, we can capture the pawn, and the game won't last much longer, King b1, we're right away ready to checkmate. Queen b2. It's not as difficult. If you watch it again, and maybe another time, you'll know it yourself. It's quite fun. We just learned the winning technique of how to win when you have an extra queen versus just one pawn far advanced to the second rank, just about to promote, but the pawn was in the middle center file, or it could have been on a knight file b or g file. However, the story may be very different if that pawn is on a bishop file.
or a rook file. You are about to find out why. In the position you see on the board, black spawn is on f2 and the king is closely by, protecting it. Again, the white king is far away and so is the white queen. But the queen can get close, you see, with a little zigzag, giving a check, king h2, and attacking the pawn from behind, and simply zigzagging on the f and g files, getting close to the black king and pawn was not the problem. The problem is getting the king also close by. And you see why it's so special. Because now, after the check, which we learned in the previous position, in the winning technique, now, thanks to the edge of the board, the black king can move to the corner and leaving behind the pawn on f2. Because if now the queen captures the pawn, that would result stalemate, yes. So, that's why this position is a draw. White cannot force the black king under the pawn because of the stalemate trick. And if the white king is not able to get close enough to the action, it's a draw. In this position, black has a rook pawn. This is a draw too. For the same reason, the white king is not able to come close enough to where the action is. The queen can get close enough, just like in the previous position, with a few zigzagging checks. Let's say check from here, and zigzagging the queen's way close to where black's king and pawn is. Or the queen could come from the starting position again this way, queen g8, and then either attacking the pawn or actually even checking the king. That's not the problem. The problem is that after the queen got close enough and gets behind the pawn and the king protects and the check comes, now the king will not move to f1 and leaving the pawn behind, but the king will go under the pawn, yes. But still, we cannot bring our king close. Why not? Again, because of the limitation of the board, the king has no place to go. After the white king comes closer, black again is in stalemate. Therefore, white cannot make progress. In this position, there is a big difference compared to the previous one. And that is that white's king is a lot closer to action. And white can win now. First step is get the queen closer to action by a check. And then a second check. And now, amazingly, white can allow the black pawn to promote by playing king g4. And after the pawn promotes, because of the unfortunate cornered position of both black king and queen, after king g3, black is not able to stop white's checkmate threats of queen c1, b1, a1, or even queen f2. White will win within a couple of moves. Now let's learn about queen versus rook. Well, first of all, I have to tell you it's a win for the side with the queen. Sometimes it's not so simple though. Well, if the king and the rook are separated from each other, far away, like in this position, all of a sudden the win is very simple. Because usually, either right away, you can give a fork, or within a couple of moves. Therefore, from the defensive side's perspective, this is the best position black can hope for. Hang on close by the king and the rook. Now, white sometimes needs to be careful, again, to avoid stalemate. Look, for example, if white here would try to attack the rook, that's not the right way to go because black would give a check, and now white could really spoil the game by playing king g3, which looks good, but it's not, because black would give up 
the last stroke on the board, resulting stalemate. In the starting position, White wins with the method of reaching this very same position with black to move, because if it's black to move here, the rook needs to go far away from the king, and then white will be able to give a fork and win the rook quite quickly or checkmate. For example, if the rook moves to h2, still hanging on, being close by to the king, then queen e1 checkmates right away. On the other hand, if the rook moves away, let's say to g8, then white would play queen e1 check, king h2, queen e5 check, king h1, and check from a1, and now it's almost over, because if the rook blocks, then we checkmate from the other corner, or if the king moves to h2, then queen a2 forks the king and the rook, and black's rook is lost, and so is the game. So in our starting position, our task is to reach this very same position with black to move, and black will be in Tsukzwan, meaning black needs to worsen their position. This is how we achieve that. We give a check, and we give a second check, and we give a third check from the corner, and a fourth check, and then we come back here, giving the right to move to black. That's the method to win. And now the rook needs to go somewhere far away from the king, and then with a couple of checks we can fork the rook and the king and win the game. Here is another exception to the rule that queen versus queen is a draw. Here again, the black king and queen are cornered. And after white playing king f2, there's nothing black can do to save the game. In this position, even though the black king and queen are cornered, white cannot win if black plays correctly. After the check, the king should go to h2, and after another check, the king should go to g1, making sure that if the check comes from the g-file, the black queen is ready to get out of the corner and block the check, and the game is a draw. On the other hand, if in this position black makes a mistake and plays king to g2, now already white is winning. Let me show you how. White would give the check on g6. Now the black queen cannot block the check. And for example, king f1, queen f5 check, king g2, queen g4 check, and now either king h2, which we are already familiar with, king f2 is the win, or king f1, then queen e2 check, king g1, and queen f2 is winning for white. Wow, what happened here? A parody of queens. Well, white just promoted the pawn on g7 to a second queen. Isn't that nice? Isn't that a simple win for white? Not really. Actually, black can save the game here, despite having only one queen, while white has two. Here, black can make a draw by perpetual checks, by checking either on e5 or on d4. For example, queen e5, queen g7, now queen b8, queen g8, queen h2, queen h7, queen e5, and just keep checking along this diagonal, h2, e5, b8, wherever the queen can give the check. That's a funny position. There is another exception to the rule that a queen versus queen is a draw, they are situations when one side or the other can win the other side's queen right away. For example here, if it's black's turn, black could give a check either on g3 or on h2, 
checking white king and after white king moves out of the way, the black queen can capture white queen. On the other hand, if it's white to move in this position, then white is winning because white would play queen to h8, forcing the black king to the g file on the same file with black's queen, and then queen check, skewer winning black's queen. In this position, white has an extra pawn, and of course, the goal is to promote that pawn. But it's black's turn. That makes it a little tricky. These type of positions are quite difficult, because in queen endgames, especially with very few pawns, there are a lot of checks, and it's not so simple to hide for the king. One of the most common ways to get away from the checks is by blocking with the queen, and if you are able to block with the queen with a counter check and therefore forcing the exchange of the queens, that's how you would win. Let's see the moves now. Queen h8 check, king b7. If now the queen gives the check from the 7th rank, g7 or h7, white already achieved the goal by blocking the check with a counter check. And if black doesn't want to lose the queen for nothing, he better trades queens, but then white's pawn will promote very easily on the following move. So black is better off giving the check from the corner, making sure white cannot block the check by immediately trading queens afterwards. Yet, white still blocks. Now check comes from this side. King moves away check again. Well, from the defensive side, very simple. You have to try giving checks, making sure the white pawn will not promote. And white, of course, have to try to hide from the checks. And that's a challenge. King b6, king b1 check, and blocking the check again. Now, after queen g6 check and king a5, black ran out of checks. So that's why black rather plays queen e4, stopping the pawn for now. And now white plays queen c5, threatening to give check and then promote the pawn, protecting the promotion square with the queen. But that allows another check, king a5, queen a2, king b5. Now white combines two threats, and these are the two typical threats to help a pawn promote. One, to check, attack the promotion square, and then promote the pawn to a second queen. And two, threaten to trade off the queen. So white now has both of those threats. And for example, after check, white could answer with counter check and trade queens, accomplishing the goal. Black plays king g3 as the best defense. And now check. After king g4 or h4, white would check on e4 and then promote the pawn. After king h2, another check. Now black has to be very careful where to move. If king h3, queen f3 and the pawn can promote. If king g2, queen e4 and again the queen is controlling the promotion square. So here, black's best answer is king g1, and then queen g3, and no more escape. After king f1 or h1, queen f3, and finally, the pawn is ready to promote. These positions, queen and pawn versus queen, are quite difficult, even for very good players. But I just wanted to show you an example how you should try to win and what are the methods to win. A, you either try to give a check attacking the promotion square and therewith helping your pawn to promote, so it's protected after it being promoted, or B, you try to trade off the queens. In queen endgames, the biggest problem is, even if you have an extra pawn or two, a lot of checks are coming, and it's not so easy to hide from them. In this case, white has two extra pawns, but black can force a draw. By checking, 
and after king e5, checking again, and going around like a star, check, and chasing the king around, around and around, and the king needs to stay close to the queen, not to lose it, and check, and check, and check, and the position is a draw. In this queen endgame, white has even three extra pawns. However, if it's black to move, black can save the game by giving perpetual checks. That's why it's crucial if the king can escape the checks or not. Black here would play queen e2, and after king h3, queen h5. The king has no choice but go back, and again queen e2. If the king comes down to the first strength, the checks come from e1 and then back again from e2. And once you reach the same position three times, the game is a draw. Wow, these are a lot of endgame positions. I hope you enjoy them. You learn